Hello, friends. Welcome back to the School of Self-Worth. I am your host, Nicole Song. Today, I am beyond thrilled to welcome our guest, Tracy Otsuka, to the podcast. So Tracy and I were set up blind date style by a mutual friend at a recent work conference. And so we got to room together and we literally had such a blast hanging out, um, talking about everything we were learning at the conference and really getting to know each other and the way you can only know someone when you are their roommate. And it got me even more excited to share her wisdom, her insight, her spark with all of you. Because Tracy is a certified ADHD coach who hosts an incredible podcast. And she's just released her first book, ADHD for smart ass women. And whether you have ADHD yourself or you know someone or love someone who has ADHD, I promise you will learn so much about how it impacts the way that they think and how they operate in the world. And you'll really start to understand the brilliance that is actually hidden in their brains. So get ready for such a fun and insightful conversation. I totally, totally, totally loved having Tracy on the podcast. And if you are a high achieving career woman who wants the exact step-by-step to understand the secret language of intuition, I've got a private podcast that gives you a complete behind the scenes on how to master intuitive communication patterns. If you are like, yes, I want that, DM me secret on Instagram at Nicole Song, and I will send over all of the details. Okay, friends, let's dig into this inspiring conversation. Let's get into it. I'm so happy to be here with you, Tracy. We were, Tracy and I, I just have to say this first, because Tracy and I were together (laughs) a week and a day ago Mm -hmm. before recording this. Yeah. And we were roommates. (laughs) <laughs> and for three nights <laughs> at a conference in LA. And we had never met before. And we had never met. We had been blind date set up roommates by a friend of ours. And we had the best time. So it just feels like a reunion to have you on the podcast. So welcome to School of Self-Worth. I am delighted to be here. Um, you are the missing part of my brain for sure. <laughs> and <laughs> what I will say is that whenever... I show up to talk about ADHD. We're always able to change some lives. So there will be someone out there listening who's thinking, this has nothing to do with me. And all of a sudden by the end, they're, oh, that's what's going on. I need to go get diagnosed. Well, it I happens mean, since we came back. So, you know, I was talking to Tracy about ADHD, which my husband experiences. And I was like, so insightful. Like there's just so many things that have been that have come out of our conversation. So Mm -hmm. let's just start with some basics, Tracy, because I think this will help. Um, Tracy has a new book coming out, by the way, and which is all about this topic. And I would love to hear first for if you could just actually talk about like the basic definition of ADHD, what are some symptoms? Because I know even talking to you, I realize there's different types. And so if you could just give us like a rundown. So for anybody who doesn't experience it or doesn't know that much about it, I will say this. I am positive that every person listening has a person in their life with ADHD, whether you know it or not. And so that this is for you, whether it's like your partner or your kid or your best friend, or also you could potentially have this as well. So could you just kind of give us some baseline information to start? Absolutely. So ADHD is a neurobiological condition. So the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. What a beautiful name. And they will, cons- they consider it a disorder. So ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, I do not. I consider it a neurobiological condition. And it, what it basically means is you struggle with sitting still, so you're hyperactive, or you've got hyperactivity going on in your brain, which is something that is kind of new, um, That meaning we're finally starting to understand it, especially in women. We may struggle to think before acting, meaning we're impulsive. And we may also struggle with focus, so which can make us seem like we're a little bit all over the place. But what I want to say is I do not believe that ADHD is a disorder. And there was actually a statistic for a study that was released last year in February or March. It was a big Canadian study. And what they determined is that 43% of all people with ADHD are actually in excellent mental health. And I'm like, not okay mental health, not good mental health, excellent mental health. 
So I was in the middle of writing my book and that's what just gave me the 100%, you know, direction. Like all I can think of is, you know, a landing strip with a plane coming in. It was so clear because I have always believed that ADHD is not a disorder. ADHD is a difference. And this study basically proved it. The problem is that Mm. in the mental health space, nobody is talking about that study. And my thought is, why aren't we focusing on what those 43% of people are doing well, what allows them to be in excellent mental health instead of focusing on the pathology, our weaknesses, and everything we can't do or we're doing wrong? So ADHD, so, so you know, it's, it's focus, it's hyperactivity, it's impulsivity. We've got that down. But there are three telltale signs that I see a lot. Um, when ADHD comes up that people don't know about. The first one is unexplained underachievement. So if you're the kind of person who um, you just know you are capable of so much more than what you're doing, you know you're not living to your potential, but you can't figure out why, I would look into ADHD. And it can even be that outwardly, Everybody else is like, oh my God, she's so successful or he's so successful, but you know you're capable of so much more. Number two, you're consistently inconsistent. So the big hard things, you just blow it out of the park. You are friggin' brilliant. But the little everyday kind of stuff like paying bills and showing up on time and not forgetting that you promised to meet a friend here or, you know, missing a Zoom meeting, like a business meeting, that kind of stuff, those sorts of administrative type details, they just confound you and you're terrible at it. Um, for a kid, it can look a lot like, oh, you, this is my son. He would get A's and D's in the same subject in the same week. So... Because you're so consistently inconsistent and the outside world sees this really bright human, the thought is, well, they're lazy, they're not trying hard enough, they're not applying themselves. And so that is the message. Those are the messages that a lot of people with, get with ADHD from the time, you know, they're kids, they're, you know, first in school. And then the third thing is that Typical productivity tools that work for everyone else, they don't work for us. Things like eat the frog, you know, where you're supposed to do the big, hard thing first thing in the morning. And I tried so much to do this for my book. Like I wanted to get it over with first thing in the morning. And I really struggled to write, right? Writing requires a linear brain. I'm all over the place. And it's really hard for me to put in, you know, like the one and then the little ABC and then the two and that like to organize that it's hard. So I tried to do it first thing in the morning. I could not do it first thing in the morning. Um, Things like time blocking, you know, where you're supposed to put your whole schedule together a week before. No, we like to be in a free flow of space and time where we kind of do things when we feel like doing it. And how am I going to know that at two o'clock on Wednesday, I'm going to feel like writing that article for, you know, Attitude Magazine? Um, And, or, you know, like, Nike, right? Just do it. Well, if we could just do it, we would have just done it. Like, we wouldn't need that. It doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. However, in all of this ADHD, what we have in common, because as you said, you can have some of the symptoms, just slight symptoms that are actually really effective. Like, I am driven beyond driven. That is a form of hyperactivity. That Mm -hmm. means that I can really make things happen and I can make them happen quickly. I wouldn't give that up for anything. But You can also have some really severe symptoms where you can't even get out of bed, you know, and you're struggling with anxiety and depression and all kinds of other, you know, comorbidities. Typically, though, what I have seen is the people that struggle the most with ADHD are people who've had pretty substantial trauma. And that's not just big T trauma. That's not just, you know, violence that, you know, happens to you or you lose a parent when you're really young. It can be the little cuts that you get every single day having ADHD. So the little T trauma. And you just feel like you're never good enough. You don't fit in. You don't know why. You think you're stupid. You you know, just all of that questioning that goes on. And all of that together can end up being one big T trauma, which ultimately is why you struggle so much with ADHD. Because the ADHD symptoms of trauma, hyperactivity, lack of focus, impulsivity, being all over the place. You've got that trauma, right? And then you pile on top of that the ADHD symptoms. 
So you can imagine that you really are all over the place. You really are completely unfocused. You are beating yourself up and the hyperactivity is in your brain. And women are only now starting to really be diagnosed, girls and women, because we didn't understand that ADHD looks very different in girls and women than it looks in men. Specifically, we are twice as likely to have inattentive ADHD. That is not me. I am hyperactive as the day is long, right? But I'm also combined type. So there's three types, impulsive, hyperactive, inattentive, or combined type, where you have some symptoms of both. And so you can imagine if you've got these symptoms on top of the, I'm repeating myself, on top of the trauma symptoms, those are the people that really, really struggle with ADHD. And there are twice as many women with inattentive ADHD as men. And inattentive ADHD for a child will look like you're sitting in the back of the classroom and you're spacey and you're in your own little fantasy world. And it's not until the teacher says, oh, hey, Tracy, that you're like, oh, well, where am I? Right. Um, that you kind of get back into reality and um, even realize, oh, what class am I in? Versus for an adult, you do you work primarily with women, right? I do. Yeah. Is it exclusively with women? Yes. Okay. I mean, I've, I've occasionally worked with men one to one, but in my okay. case, it's, so it's like yeah. it's like my work. Um, and so then, adult women will look more like the absent-minded professor. So they will be brilliant in their area, but then everything else, you know, their car's a mess, their house is a mess. They can't, you know, get any food on the table. They can't even shop. Basically, if you've met one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD. So mm -hmm. the symptoms all look different, and that's what makes it so confusing. But what they all have in common is they all have interest-based nervous systems. So if we are doing something in an area of interest, we pop into hyperfocus and we're brilliant. When we are required to do something that is not of interest, um, like a neurotypical, so it's importance-based, right? Meaning that it's important that to you that I do something. It's important to my teachers that I do something or my parents or my partner. Um, those people can, can do it versus if you have an ADHD brain and you have an importance or an, uh, an interest-driven brain, you can try. We can do it using certain, you know, um, strategies, but it's really, really hard for us. And so because we can do things we're interested in, that's why everybody will be like, oh, it's a moral failing. It's a character flaw. She could do it if she wanted to, but she chooses not to. And really what it is, is neurobiology. Hmm. Um, do you want me to continue going through how it looks different in women? Yeah. I think it's super interesting actually. Yeah. Well, gonna I was going to say this before you keep going with this, because one of the things I noticed, even in the conversation we were talking about, like you said, um, you know, people don't focus on what the people in excellent mental health. And that was one of the takeaways I had after you and I were roommates, because mm -hmm. you were like, you know, you just need to address it with the way it works for that particular person. And then it takes down like the more extreme symptoms, and then they can actually be really happy and successful and like, existing in a way that works for them versus feeling that stress or like you were saying, when you have like those little T traumas piling up every single day. And that's one thing I think I had never really recognized or realized for people that you could just actually, if you can just address, each person probably needs a different way of dealing with it. But once you really find that way, then they, you know, they really have like a lot more ease and flow in their life is what I'm hearing from you. Absolutely. And so what it all comes down to is positive emotion. Mm. The ADHD brain thrives with positive emotion and positively wilts with negative emotion. So mm -hmm. you can imagine these kids and the statistic is something like by the time a child is 10, that child with ADHD has heard 20,000 more negative messages than a child who doesn't have ADHD. Which is wild because all of us have so much negative messaging. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. just, I mean, I work with people all the time. I would say probably more neurotypical, although I have some clients with ADHD who we work so hard on this because I mean, we already say you need six positive at least minimum for every one negative thought. So then yes. if you're thinking with the ADHD brain, it's like just way worse than that. Even. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sadly, um, the ADHD brain, because it's so creative and it's just thoughts, 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 we can kind of veer towards the negative. It, it's And it's so crazy because we're generally such optimistic people. Like if we got to the store 
one time, 15 minutes, it was a holiday and there was no traffic and the trap, the stoplights were out in our brain. We always get to the store in 15 minutes. We just have that ADHD optimism, but Mm -hmm. the same part of it, and especially if there's trauma is this negative, you know, this negative loop because of there's something called the task positive network and the default mode network. Have you ever talked about that with anybody? No, I haven't. So there are two networks in the brain and with the ADHD brain, they're glitchy. So the average brain, the neurotypical brain, they will start working on something and they'll be in the task positive network. And when they're done, they will switch out of the task positive network and they will move into the default mode network. Now, the default mode network is where our creativity is. It's where all of our thoughts are. And so it's really great, but it also has some of the brooding, ruminating stuff going on, right? And you remember with the ADHD brain, we can pop into hyperfocus. Hyperfocus can be good or bad. And sometimes we can pipe, pop into hyperfocus where we're just focusing on, well, why did I do that? And who said, you know, what, what did I say to that person? And just like all of this overthinking. So the ADHD brain, we can be in action in the task positive network working on something. And all of a sudden, because it's glitchy, our our switch is glitchy. All of a sudden, we're in the default mode network, which I call the demon network, right? Mm -hmm. And we're questioning, oh, this sucks. This is terrible. Like everybody's going to hate this, you know, whether it's art or writing or whatever. And so we're stuck then in the default mode network. And it's like, well, how do I get back into the task positive network? Well, the deal is the way you get back in is through action right? You do something to get out of your brain. You go pet your dog. You go call a friend. You go out and run. You Anything to get out of that default mode network. And so for a lot of us that have this drivenness quality, that are also entrepreneurs, that are action takers, we have learned that when we're in action in the task positive network, that's when we feel really good, right? That's when we feel in positive emotion. And so it's like doing the scary stuff is actually what fires our dopamine. So if we can teach ourselves that kind of strategy mm-hmm. and we can hyper-focus on, okay, well, if I don't feel good today, what can I do that's kind of scary that will get me into action? And then I do it and then I celebrate it, you're firing your own dopamine. So it really is about learning how to work with your own dopamine, because the thought is our brains don't make enough dopamine. That's ultimately what the problem is with ADHD. And we don't know, is it that we don't make enough dopamine or we don't process it in the similar way? And so there are weaknesses around that, but for every weakness, there is an opposing strength, right? Well, everything you're talking about, you know, we talk so much about self-worth on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And so I could see that with anyone with ADHD, like that that journey around self-worth would be just treacherous in a totally different way. And it's already difficult, I would say, for the average human yeah. to navigate that, right? Like it's challenging because we have this negativity bias in our brains and there's a lot of difficulty yeah. for us. And then we live in the world where we're like, you know, phones and pinging us. And there's so much stuff going on that's impacting our our ability to see ourselves for who we really are. And so now you're talking about adding in this whole different level of challenge within the brain. And so, which leads me to you, like, and I'm curious for you then, so how did you start to navigate it in a way or like really like first figure out that you had ADHD and then how did that affect your journey with self-worth and understanding yourself on a deeper level? Hmm. So um, I was diagnosed after my son was diagnosed at 12 And we took him to a psychologist who supposedly specialized in ADHD. And she told my husband and me that our job as his parents was to reduce his expectations so he wouldn't be disappointed in life. And this was, I don't know, nine years ago. This was not that long ago. Um, And I remember thinking, I had no idea that I had ADHD, but I remember thinking, why would you ever tell any human that? I don't care if you're intellectually disabled. I wouldn't tell a human that. And so I started to do the research and because I was like, okay, I'm not going to try. And she recommended a book and I bought the book and it was so negative. All it talked about is all the ADHD related car crashes and how we have a, you know, a, a shorter lifespan. And it was really depressing. And I'm like, I'm not giving this to my son and I'm not talking about this. So I'm going to have to forge my own way. And so I started to do research and I found these two doctors Um, Ned Hallowell and John Rady, who taught at places like Harvard, and they were 
the experts in ADHD, and they also had ADHD. I'm mm-hmm. like, and they were much more strength focused. So I was like, that's who I'm going to follow. So I read it, it, the book was called ADHD Driven to Distraction. So I read it the first time, didn't see myself in it at all because women have different symptoms than men. Mm -hmm. And um, then I read it the second time. And somewhere in there, it said hyperactivity is, drivenness is a form of hyperactivity. And that's when I realized that, oh my gosh, he got his ADHD from me because I didn't have the I mean, I did have some focus issues and I definitely had executive function issues. I have, I'm completely time blind and, and ADHD is ultimately a problem with your executive functions, meaning planning, scheduling, time blindness, working memory, as you saw so beautifully exhibited a minute ago, um, motivation, like how to start, but then also how to stop, right? We struggle with transitions. So I saw those things in me and I always wondered about them. But I was nothing if not driven. And people would look at me and say, okay, she went to law school. She went to graduate law school. She um, worked as a lawyer. Then she ran a high-end women's wear business. You know, 60% of her business was Saxon Eamons Nordstrom. I worked for two dozen banks, you know, during the whole foreclosure crisis, basically selling their their foreclosures, their REOs. I love that job. Um, And so I knew there were things about me that were really different but I never struggled with the self-worth. In fact, I was probably the opposite. I was extremely confident. And that is what would allow, it was that drivenness, right? That hyperactivity Mm -hmm. that would allow me to do stuff that other people, and the impulsivity, fearlessness, it would allow me to do stuff that other people would say, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. And And I probably should have heeded it sometimes, but I just went with it. So I didn't struggle to have with problems until perimenopause. So what we now know is that estrogen modulates dopamine. Mm -hmm. And we know that our brains, the struggle is the lack of dopamine or the way we process dopamine. And all of a sudden, my working memory got so much worse. And this confidence that I had, this just kind of... (laughs) Yeah, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Just going out there, that drivenness, that fearlessness, all of a sudden I started to really second guess myself. And I started to have that, that, you know, the voice in my head, like, what are you doing? Do you think you can do this? And I would constantly, what am I trying to say? I would constantly discount it and I would keep going, but it was getting harder and harder for me. And I didn't know what it was. And things that were, so my hyperfocus has always been parties. Like I love to cook and I was the kind of person who I could have 75 people over for dinner and I wouldn't even think twice of it. Mm-hmm. And every single time I would be doing, like I, I've always joked about like Martha Stewart. So her daughter, Alexa, um, was diagnosed with ADHD and I'm certain Martha has it because I always felt like her, you know, like I'd see the stuff she'd do and I'm like, that's not good enough. That could be better. That could be more visually appealing, you know, and my friends would be like, oh gosh, you're nuts. But as long as they got invited to my parties, right, it was all good. I got to the point where I remember there was a, my kids went to a a private school, a Catholic school, and there was a, um, you know, they would have these, uh, what did they call them? Like events where they raise money. What are those called? Charity thing, you know, dinners? Fundraisers, yeah. Fundraisers, that's it. And I would always donate a meal. And I donated a meal. And usually it was like 12 people and it would be, you know, it would be fabulous. And it was right when all the foreclosures started happening. And so it was a year and they had a year to book it. And it was a year that passed. And when she called me a year, it was a year and a half, a year and a half later, I was like, I don't want to do it. I can't do it. I can't rely on myself. I can't even follow a recipe anymore. I can't do this for 12 people. And I was like, what is going on with you? And it was my working memory was so bad. And it was my time management where I would literally sit in the kitchen and I would be spinning because I couldn't figure out what do I do first? What do I do second? When does this come out? When does this go in? And I was always bad at it but I could somehow organize it so I could get it done, right? The creativity that I was able to, because creativity is one of our primary um, strengths, 
In fact, scientists also say ideation and all the ideas and the creativity, that is what we do really well with ADHD brains. And so that is what I was able to focus on. And so then the other stuff, I wasn't so good, but I could kind of make it work. But I was a disaster. And so I did everything to not do it. And I remember telling the woman who ran the whole thing that, sorry, I can't do it. And I remember feeling so bad about that and also thinking, what the hell is wrong with me? Like, what happened to my confidence? What happened to my ability to just do these big things and think nothing of it? And so I ended up going to, I really thought I had dementia is what I thought it was. And so I ended up going to a, um, so many different people, my primary doctor, my gynecologist, a hormone specialist, a psychologist, a, um, I was tested for Parkinson's. I went to a naturopath. None of them ever mentioned ADHD. In fact, the psychologist that I went to, and you'll appreciate this, said to me, you know what, Tracy? And I was, I had this like, I, I guess they call it dystemia. I don't even think it's a diagnosable thing anymore. It's, you know, that label is now gone, but it was, I'd always been so upbeat and positive and happy. And I was, I was anxious. I had, you know, I used to think, oh my God, I cause anxiety. I don't have anxiety. I was starting to feel anxious and I was starting to feel a little, I never called it depressed, but it was just this low level, oh, like I wasn't excited about things the way I was before. And so I went to the psychologist and she said to me, Tracy, she was um, Chinese American. And she said, you know what? it's because you're Japanese. It's because you're Asian. You know, the bloom comes off the rose and we are just such high achievers and it's never going to get as good as it got, as it was before, because you've done all these things. So, you know, that's just what it is. You're not anxious. You're not depressed. You're not any of those things. And I remember going home and I'm like, well, I'm something because I can't remember anything anymore. And I can't do, you know, my confidence was shot. And so once my son was diagnosed, that's when everything started to come together and I put it all together that, oh my gosh, drivenness is a form of hyperactivity. And the other one was, um, I can't remember what it was. It's like, I have to find, so this is how my brain works. I have to find the first word. And when I can find the word, then everything else connects to it. But there are certain words and certain phrases that there's like a whole, and they're just so easy for me to forget. But what I'm trying to say is... Um, well, I was going to say first that you're doing a great job describing it, like what's going on in your brain. So like that's helpful to me, and I know it's helpful to all of our listeners, but I'm curious if it is related to the creativity and the ideation and the intuition, which is what I do. But if so that's, that's the word. All part of it. Mm -hmm. That's the word. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Not everybody has um, a problem with working memory. Mm -hmm. My son has no problem with working memory, but I actually think that's because he also has um, dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And so he has learned like his auditory, like memory, and he just can remember everything. But I, I actually think it's because he also has that, you know, that dyslexia. So he's gotten so good at at speaking and wor the working memories always, you know, going there for him. But what I was trying to say is um, we also have, and I cannot remember the phrase, but what it is, is intuition. So we can walk into a room and know what's going on without knowing the people at times. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because if you can't rely on your brain, right, and you can't rely on your working memory, and you can't rely on your focus, you start to, your, your attention is so dissipated. You're not looking, you, you don't have focused attention. So it's not linear how, you're, how you go in and you, you know, get all the information you need to determine, okay, what do you need to do next? Your, your focus is so dissipated that you notice everything. You notice the look you know, that someone has, like, you know, the twitch that their eye makes or, you know, that how their mouth moves when they're not telling the truth or how, um, you know, there's some sort of, um, you know, rustling in the leaves and that signifies something, you know, that, and a lot of this is because I really believe that ADHD is evolutionary. And so it's this intuition that we learn to trust 
when our brains can't be trusted. So we tend to be very highly intuitive. And so it was those two things that really made me realize that, oh my gosh, it is ADHD, that that is what's going on with me. But still, I, I was tested three times because I kept thinking, how can I be accomplished? How can I be successful? How can I be, like before, so confident? And how can it be ADHD? There's so many parts of ADHD that do, this doesn't sound like. But you have to understand that you meet one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD. We all have different symptoms. And so during perimenopause, when my estrogen was bouncing around, I had not only the general symptoms of perimenopause that everybody has, because every woman, right, because their estrogen goes down. On top of that, I also had the ADHD, you know, problems with not enough estrogen that leads to not enough dopamine. So once I put two and two together, it was such a relief, right? That I realized, and I was tested for Parkinson's and I realized that, okay, I don't have dementia. This is just my brain. And the shame or the beating myself up I was doing around, well, why can't you remember that word? Or how in the hell did you forget to pick up your kids? You know, mm -hmm. things like that. I, you know, like, how did you even forget you had kids? Because that can happen to me at times too. I'll get so hyper focused, I'll forget I even had kids. So it was all those things that were happening. There was finally a reason. And once there was a reason, then I could work around um, finding different strategies, different workarounds. And I also discovered that <laughs> screw this, this is neurobiology. This is not a character flaw. This is not a moral failing. And so I am going to focus on what I do well and what my gifts are rather than focusing on all the things that I can't do. Because again, for every, you know, um, every negative trait, there is an absolutely positive trait. But when we are diagnosed with ADHD, typically, we're only told about all the things we can't do. We're not told that 43% of all people with ADHD are actually in excellent mental health. So that really helped self-esteem, right? Because there was a reason why. Well, so much of what you say, I mean, it resonates with me. I mean, being married to somebody who also has ADHD, like I feel like the more, even just having that conversation with you in LA, I feel like I know him better. Like I understand him better because I'm like, oh, like that's why those things are happening. And then even what you were saying too about being really intuitive, that makes sense because I he is also highly intuitive and I can, like we can go to a party and he just has noticed mm -hmm. everything. And I'm a very aware person. Like I see everything. I don't miss very much. And he mm -hmm. catches, and like he actually catches things that I don't even see sometimes. And it's kind of amazing to be around that. Yeah. But I get it now, you know, like from what you're explaining and saying. And I also love what you're saying about that focus on the positive because I feel like ADHD has often like a very negative connotation. Like you think of like a hyper child who can't sit still in school and like that's not, I mean, it's not helpful for anybody. But mm -hmm. the thing that I'm actually curious about because I feel like kids have been the focus for a very long time and I am experiencing a lot of friends or people, or adults who are getting this diagnosis much later in life. And I'm curious mm -hmm about why is that happening? Is it just more study of it, more awareness of it, or understanding of it that's prompting it? Or people are just like, hey, maybe I have ADHD and that's what's causing all of these challenges. Well, I think that they're finally realizing that first of all, girls have ADHD. Mm -hmm. And you know, yes, I mean, they've been, they've been diagnosed for ADHD for a long while. But the truth of the matter is most doctors, most therapists, most you know, clinicians, they don't even know what ADHD looks like. And so they don't know if it's not the, you know, 10 year old boy who's climbing the walls, who's annoying everybody, who's externalizing his symptoms, getting in fights, being oppositional, right? If it doesn't look like that, they don't even see that it's ADHD. And for girls, because of the inattention, you know, they're twice as likely to have inattentive ADHD. They can look like the girl that's sitting in the back of the classroom who doesn't even realize what's going on until they're called on because they're in their own fantasy world. Or they can look like the woman who is an absent-minded professor, brilliant at what she does well, and kind of a disaster in everything else. So what girls and women tend to do is they internalize their symptoms mm -hmm. and they beat themselves up about it, right? There's a lot of shame and, 
you know, a lot of it is society too, right? We are expected not only to manage our own like administrative executive function challenges, but we're also expected to manage, you know, the home and our partner and, you know, you know, all the administrative stuff related to having a family. So if you are really bright, which most of us are, and you got through college and you did really well, and then you're in your job and you're doing really well in your job, but you're kind of hanging on, right? All of a sudden you have a kid and everything goes to hell because it's not just the kid, then it's the house, it's your partner, it's everything. And if you think about it, so the reason this is so serious is because 24% of women with ADHD will attempt suicide. It's a really serious statistic. So that's not part of that 43%, right? But a big part of the reason is because girls are expected to be neater. They're supposed to be more organized. They're supposed to be more polite. They're supposed to be less all over the place, less loud, less chatty, you know, all of that. Um, well, they can be chatty. That's the one that I'll, I'll give them. Um, but the thought is, oh, that's just a girl. No, that's typically a girl with ADHD. That's hyperactivity. But it shows differently in girls than it does in boys and differently in men than it does in women. So I think what happened is TikTok, right? All of these women, we were going to our, you know, clinicians, whatever, whomever, and we were told it's anxiety, it's depression, or it's all in your head. It's nothing, honey. Or it's, you know, it's perimenopause. I mean, that was a big one. It's hormones. It's always hormones, right? And so what happened was during COVID, a lot of us were trapped in our homes. And all of a sudden, we not only had to manage everything else we've been managing, but we also had to manage our kids' education. We had to manage getting them on Zoom, you know, making sure their homework was done, making sure that, you know, they had some sort of social engagement. And that was enough to just literally, you know, that was the last wheel off the cart and we could not do anymore. So a lot of people started talking about it on TikTok. And because the doctors weren't listening to us, we started getting curious, right, at oh my gosh, it's not anxiety. I mean, it can be anxiety and depression. It can be comorbid. But often you treat the ADHD and the anxiety and the depression also subside or go away entirely. And it makes sense. If you're constantly like that swan, you know, everything looks perfect on the outside, but you're like, you know, paddling as fast as you can just to keep up, just to stay up. It makes sense that this would generate anxiety and depression because you feel so much shame around it. And, oh, my gosh, I hope I can keep up. The other thing is that girls are typically diagnosed much later than boys. They, they mm -hmm. see the symptoms later. So with boys, it's, you know, 7 to, let's say, 10. For girls, it's, again, it's puberty because mm -hmm. it's about hormones estrogen modulates dopamine. And so whenever we have bouncing around, you know, the dopamine's bouncing around. So puberty, pregnancy, I have never been as efficient. And oh my gosh, if I could have my pregnancy brain, yet all my friends were like, I'm so tired. I can't do anymore. I'm so behind. And I was just like a whirling dervish because our body makes so much estrogen when we're pregnant. Postpartum mm -hmm. is another time. And then of course, um, it, our, our estrogen really goes down and it, it goes down greatly postpartum, which is why, you know, many women with ADHD struggle with, you know, postpartum, what is it? Postpartum disorder. Is depression. that what they call it? Yeah. Depression. depression yeah. Postpartum depression. Um, but then the hormones really take a dive during perimenopause and menopause. And so it explains something that I call maturity onset ADHD. So you were just flying with the ADHD, right? up until your estrogen starts going lower and lower and lower. And all of a sudden you start struggling with things like anxiety and things with this, you know, dystemia or depression and just confidence. Um, and you don't know what it is. I, I literally felt even my handwriting changed, which is why I got tested for Parkinson's. I couldn't do like little buttons anymore. It was, it was just so weird. And it's, was all related to, you know, this lowering of dopamine levels. Yeah. Well, what you're sharing is so insightful. And I'm sure for any woman who might be like, maybe I do have it or just starting to understand it, that it's just a totally different level of things to manage. And it has nothing to do with like you needing to work on anything. It's just actually 
yeah. imbalances, right, that are happening yeah. in your brain that you need to work out. And um, I feel like it's a really powerful thing, though, because then it gives you that power back to say, oh, like, there's something I can do about it versus feeling like at the mercy of, you know, experiences in your life or things that are going on. Well, and the beauty, Nicole, of ADHD and strategies for ADHD is that it works for anyone. So if mm. anyone is feeling a little anxious, a little down, a little lacking in confidence, all of the things that work for ADHD pretty much work for anyone. So like my number one thing is exercise. Exercise increases our dopamine. In fact, in the UK, exercise is the first line of defense. That's the first prescription that's written if you're depressed. Because when you exercise, 20, it's only 25 minutes at 70% of your high, you know, your highest heart rate, mm -hmm. your max heart rate. Um, it is as effective as a course of Adderall and a course of Prozac at the same time, oh, wow. as far as lifting mood. So, you know, if medication works for you, great. I wish it worked for me. One time it did. And I felt, I, I'm so grateful for the one time it worked because I was, I was going to be giving a speech. And again, I have no working memory. I cannot memorize anything. Everything has to come from just me. Mm -hmm. And I was going to give a speech. I could not memorize the speech. I took one time Ritalin. And it was the, like the sky opened and I literally, I drove home and I recited that speech five times without a glitch. It only worked that one time. It never worked again. <laughs> never worked I again. still keep thinking there must be a medication. There must be something. So like I keep trying, but nothing works. Yeah. So I have had to use strategies like exercise that don't involve medication. Um, but they truly, I, I, you know, and even like the strategies as far as, you know, organization, um, they work for everybody. So yeah, it's not just for people with ADHD or it could be, oh, well, I struggle with this, this, and this, but I don't struggle with that last thing. So maybe some of these strategies will work. I mean, it makes sense to me. Like exercise is a huge thing. I don't think, I mean, Tracy and I have only just recently gotten to know each other, but I wrote a fitness column for six years for the Seattle Times. So for me, it's always been the way that I can feel consistently stable wow. and good about myself. And if I'm not doing it, you know, and Tracy saw me get up at 6 a.m. every day because I was like, I got to go on a walk. I'll see you later because we were in this conference like hours and hours and hours at a time. Yeah. And I was like, I cannot function. And I also cannot process my life without movement, like moving my body just like help me deal with stress and build yes. up and anything that's going on. So it makes complete sense to me that like that would be another really great tool for anybody because also we're just designed to move whatever your brain composition, right? Like you yeah. were designed to do it. And so it helps you no matter what. So I love that that's one of the main things that you're- Well, and we should do. point out that Nicole got up every morning at six and actually went and worked out versus I was like, I'm not going to get up at six. And I, you know, my thing was going into that gym with all of those people. Mm -hmm. I just, it was like too much. And so I didn't work out and I proceeded to lose my laptop with my computer and my whole life in it. I lost two pairs of glasses. All of these things were returned. And this ADHD oh optimism. Goodness. I'm like, they're going to come back. I lost two pairs of glasses. I lost my, I left my phone with all my credit cards and my driver's license in a um, restaurant bathroom. And then the last day, I don't know if you know this, Nicole, I got a text from the people that were running the conference. And it was like, uh, we have your, um, your notebook. <laughs> Apparently I had written my name and address and I was just like, that's the final straw. But this is exactly what happens when you're completely overstimulated, right? And I, I was stressed about the book and you know, I had so much I should have been doing. And so I'm half at the conference, half with the book. But the big thing for me was the lack of exercise. That is yes. what starts my day and I didn't do it. Yes. And I understand. I mean, we were up late, like we were doing so much, but I also have learned four hours time. Of yeah. Like, and for me, it's just like a life strategy. It's like, if I don't do that, I will just lose my mind and I just yeah. cannot tolerate anything that's outside. And by the way, a thousand person conference zone is definitely outside of my comfort zone. And so I was like, this is a lot. This what? is so stimulating. I'm like a borderline introvert, extrovert. It was a lot. So I can understand that if you're somebody where you're always dealing with a lot of stuff in your brain, that exercise would be like a key way that you have to manage it. I mean, it's energy, right? And so if you've got all this energy in your brain, you've got to have a way to get out of, get it out. And yeah. so people who really struggle with inattentive ADHD and, you know, depression and anxiety and those thoughts, oh my gosh, you've got to go work out because how do you get rid of that energy? 
Totally. I don't know of another way. I mean, there, there are ways. That's not true. I mean, yeah. you can do tapping, you can do somatic therapies. There's, you know, yoga, all that kind of stuff. But for me, the fastest, easiest way is something aerobic that is, you know, really makes me go to my max heart rate. Yeah. Well, that makes so much sense. Well, I have a few fast action questions for oh, you. No? Crazy already told me she's not really, that's like not her thing. So let's just try one. We don't have a fast action brain. <laughs> So let's just let's just try one and see how it goes, and then we'll go from there. So, okay. uh, I don't know if you're watching TV right now because I know you're super full up. But what was the last thing you watched on television? Um, MSNBC, Rachel Maddow. Okay, see, you got it. You did it. She, <laughs> she was okay. Awesome. All right, and then let's just do. One more easy one. What um, are the top three most used emojis on your phone? Oh my gosh. So I am so corny. Anything with hearts. Anything so all hearts. of the little, yeah. The one with the heart eyes, the one with the hearts all around it, the heart. Oh, and the squirrel. I always do the heart and the squirrel together. What does that mean? The squirrel emoji and the heart emoji. I know, I know but what does the squir squirrel and the heart together mean for you? Like when you're well, telling somebody squirrel and squirrel heart. Squirrel, hold on. She's yeah. gonna tell us. Oh, because you just because you love squirrels, like it doesn't mean like oh things are crazy right now. It's just like no, squirrel. It, okay, think about it. You know how they're always like squirrel, right? Yes. Squirrel means you're all over the place. You're connecting nut, uh, collecting nuts. You're all over the place. So, yeah. So the squirrel emoji is ADHD, and the heart emoji is like me. Oh, I love that. That's cute. <laughs> And for those of you, if you're not watching it, she was holding, she has a stuffed squirrel or like a- Like a and, real one, ew! She's got like a, she's got, I can't tell on the video, but she's got a skull squirrel. Fran got it for me. It was cute. It was super, super cute. Like a stuffy, a squirrel stuffy. Yeah. His and, name uh, is Stuffy. That's awesome. That's so good. Okay. Well, also, and your book is coming out so soon. So tell us a little bit about your book, yes. Tracy, for anybody yes, who- yes. Yes, please check out her book. So I wrote this book because I just knew I had to change the conversation on ADHD or around ADHD because I kept meeting these brilliant women, right? Every single one of them that came onto my podcast. I'm, I've met thousands of women at this point in time, all with ADHD. They all have a brilliant brain. Mm. Their charge is to figure out where their brilliance lies. And so many of them are focused on the shame and everything they can't do right instead of on their strengths. And as I said, positive emotion is, it's just where we have to be. So if I can take an ADHD woman who's all in shame and really point her towards all of the things that she really is so brilliant at, it's amazing how literally there's a 180 in sometimes five days, like that quickly. So I wrote this book because I want women to fall in love with their ADHD brain. There are so many gifts to ADHD. Let's figure them out. And then there are strategies for the things that you struggle with. And mm -hmm. you know what? This is more than turning pages in a book for me. It's about changing awareness. Um, in women's lives and really re rewriting the chapters, right? Or re let's say rewriting the ending. Because when we realize where our brilliance is, the sky's the limit. It, you're never too late. The thing, the magic about ADHD is when we can get into our purpose, we are very mission driven. Because, you know, we have all these ideas, right? So which idea do we follow? That's usually the problem. So we're doing all this stuff and our background, it makes no sense. When we can focus on our purpose, then what happens is because we're so mission driven, everything we do is built around that purpose. We do things so quickly because of hyper focus. And I have seen women who are literally just depressed and doing absolutely nothing. And the next year, I don't even recognize them. And so that was my goal, you know, and they've gotten there through the podcast. So my goal was to take what we do in the podcast and convert it into book form so that, um, it's quicker. <laughs> Beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Well, make sure you grab a copy of ADHD for Smart Ass Women because it's – I've ordered my copy already. I can't wait to read it. It's going to be you. such an – just a lifesaver, I think, for so many people who are listening and wondering and like, oh, or even again, if you know someone with – with it, like you'll just be such a better friend or a partner yeah. or a parent to them because you'll just know so much more about that. And then also to make sure to check out her podcast because there's lots of brilliance and we'll have all of that linked in the show notes below. Great. Can yes. I just, can I just 
cite the link ADHD smartwomen.com forward slash book. And if you go to that link, there are also bonuses to um, purchasing the book. So please do. Yes. Go grab those bonuses. And again, we'll make sure we get that link in the show notes as well. Tracy, what a delight to have you on School of Self-Worth and just also to connect with you in person in this way. It's so much fun. And I feel like we're so aligned in the kind of things that we teach and work on. And I really love hearing about how you're out there helping women in the world. So thank you so much for being on here. Thank you. It was a pleasure.